So I think that um, part of the human experience and part of what I love talking about in that human experience, in what we are looking at across social media and marketing channels and everything that's going on, and again, AR, VR, the technology that's coming, the... Uh, Sorry. And so everything that happens and to us over the next few years is probably one of the most exciting times of marketing. I mean, wouldn't you agree that this is going to be interesting in the next few years as we're starting to learn more about how to scale more, how to use technology and human experience together? That's what I'm going to be talking about. But I'm going to give you actual ways that you can use those in best practices today. All right? So the first thing that we need to talk about, and this is a very important thing, it's the circle of trust. Now, how many people here have seen Meet the Fockers? Or Meet the Parents, actually. Meet the Fockers was the second movie. Meet the Parents was a phenomenal movie in my mind. Maybe yours too by the clapping that just happened. And I do know that one of the things about Meet the Parents, especially Gaylord Fokker, F-O-C-K-E-R, <laughs> is that he is totally human. This guy is so lovable that because he screws up so much that we just want to give the guy a hug every time he does it. And we also know that every time he does that, all he really wants to do is belong. He wants to be inside the circle of trust. Isn't that everyone? Isn't that everybody online as we're building our communities, as we're starting to engage? Everybody is on the outside of the circle of trust and we're trying to build our own circles, wherever that is. It is totally fascinating to me as well for all the different ingredients of what goes into the basic elements of why we love humans or people. I think we should do um, shots every time somebody uses the word human, by the way. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. All right. That'll be fun. So who is Gaylord Fokker? It takes a strong push on the remote, by the way. I'm not just like, hail Gaylord Fokker. Um, <laughs> He is a genuine guy. He has a heart for everything that he gets into. He passed his MCATs, we all know that, and eventually just be, not just, but was a, um, a male nurse. He embraces imperfection by far, and he embraces humor. Now, these are the qualities for which I believe engage us the most with other people. And you don't have to be all these different things. We are multidimensional as people. But at the same time, when we have these different experiences and these different emotions, when we're, whether we're online or off, that's what makes us want to connect. And so it's hard, and it's really hard, to embrace imperfection as a person or a brand when people are watching you. And people are watching you. We've been talking about this all day about how going on live video when people are watching you and all you want to do is actually connect with other people. You want to feel natural and normal, and yet we're not. <laughs> what am I going to talk about? How am I going to say it? What am I going to say? What are they going to think of me? Is this a good time to say press the damn button? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well Thank you. So when we want to embrace our own human moments, we also know that things can happen. When you go to press the button, something could go awry. And quite frankly, I think it's brilliant when it does. As long as you handle it well, right? You embrace it, you own it, and you say, that's me. That's what happens. And actually, I think we all like each other better for it unless you hit a volleyball into your mother-in-law's face or sister-in-law's face at a pool, which I may or may not have done. And I'm no longer dating her. And my wife thinks that that's funny. <laughs> and now my name is Gaylord Fokker.
There we go. All right. Okay, so we're talking about human moments. We're talking about moments when you just go to do something and you're about to send something out or you're about to press that button or you have something that you know you need to release to the public in some way. And this happens all the time to every single person here when you're going to push anything out on social media, right? Now, have, has anybody, and I'd love to see a show of hands, has anybody here released in what, what you might call an email blast or an email uh, newsletter or an email out to more than one person at a time? So I'm gonna go with like 99% of people. Now, who has fear of, <laughs> of actually saying, if I click send and something's wrong with this email, all, this is not gonna be good, my whole life is going to be horrible and I don't know what I'm going to do with myself because of that one grammatical error that I know Bob Jones is going to call me out on on email like he does every other week. And hopefully there's no Bob Jones here. And, and I know that this is going to happen, right? Like some, something, one thing, which might make us more human. Well, one day I actually went to press send and all of a sudden I stopped and I was like, I don't know if this is... It. Like there's something wrong with it. So I went to, um, to my business partner and, and wife and I said, can you please check this out and see if this is right? She, and, I, and she said, no, I'm looking at it. Everything looks great. She's a copywriter. So I'm like, perfect. But I don't trust her still. <laughs> because she doesn't know that Bob Jones exists. <laughs> so I, have, I send it to somebody else and I'm like, can you look at this? I trust you with this information. Can you look at it? And they, nope, everything looks great. All right. So I go ahead and I schedule it for the next morning and I go to bed. I wake up the next morning and I am flooded with all these replies because I forgot to change the brackets where name exists. <laughs> Instead of having hello, Bob, I had hello, name, go out to 30,000 people. Oh my God, it was the worst moment ever. And I was like, what am I gonna do? This was supposed to be you know, important. This wasn't just a newsletter, this is a product release where people are gonna purchase something. Now they're like, you idiot. So the next morning, I thought about this and the next morning I finally sent another email to everybody. And I said, just kidding, or dear name, just kidding, we know your name is Dave. And everyone was like replying back going, that's so nice that you actually acknowledge the error. And they replied back saying, I really appreciate that you actually had some humor around it. And I then proceeded to actually have more clicks and more opens and more people respond with all of these great things saying back to me, hi name, I mean Brian, I love you more now. Or hi name, I mean Brian, way to save the day. Honestly, I didn't even notice it. And so and I was like, oh yeah, it never happened. So a year later now, I still get hi name and people think it's still funny. So I do think that by having these moments happen, um, while I did get extra clicks, I got extra opens and I sold more product than I ever did before. And I thought about maybe just screwing up once a month because that would raise my revenue, but that's not right. So I'm not going to do that. But I do think that if we can actually learn to embrace those moments, those Fokker moments, then they'll start to become real. Because what happened is everyone started to see that there was a real person behind this email that was being sent out, where normally they think it's an email blast. And that was the difference. And I was like, huh, there's something to this in the way that we write things and the way that we respond to things. So now in every newsletter that I send out, I have a question at the bottom and I urge them, beg them and ask them, please reply back to me and I will reply back. And now after a year of doing that, I spend about 24 hours replying back to everybody that replies to me. And before you know it, I'm having engaged conversations with all these people. Huh, actual conversations with people. That's an incredible thing, right? <laughs> Who knew? So the point being that if we can actually get people to reply and we can reply back, we might actually have connection, which will further that development into more things that could potentially happen. Now, about four years ago, I, um, I gave this presentation uh, with a slide that showed up called, there's no more B2B or B2C, it's H to H, human to human. And it was a really, um, really wonderful time in my career as well because this, this slide actually ended up 
uh, in this one moment, this is the actual picture that was taken that ended up getting over 80 million impressions. It had over 15 languages that it was translated into and 500 plus bloggers writing about it. And it just really like, I was just like, I can't believe that I'm like Gaylord Fokker and this, this thing just happened. But I've been talking about this for the last 20 years in our agency. And I started to realize that we needed this more now than ever, that humans need to talk to humans more now and even more so now today. Because as technology is coming and everything that you just learned about here this morning, especially when you look at the AR, VR stuff, we're gonna start to disconnect a little bit. Well, the technology is great, but what about the actual interaction that needs to take place that actually we buy from? Because we buy from people, we don't buy from companies. We don't buy from, from brands when we're talking about an actual considered purchase. And so building that actual engagement is huge. I also believe that <laughs> I believe that the clicker is going to click. That there are three things that are made up of being a human brand. Now, again, this is going to be human participation here. First of all, you need to all take shots because I just said human. And second of all, I want everybody here, if you don't mind, or maybe just a few people, yell out, yell out um, a brand that reminds you of simplicity. Now, what brand is actually simplistic in nature? You get them right away and how simple they are with perhaps their product offering or their brand itself. What brand is simple? S sit. Whoa. No ad, no ad suntan lotion. That's intriguing. Can I talk to you after? What else? The Honest Company. Oh, they're great. Yep. That's simple. What else? Anything else? Charmin. Charmin. One job. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Lighting is good. Lime aid is good. <laughs> what? Life is good. Life is good. So is lime aid. Huh? Cal marketing. Cal marketing? Yeah. <laughs> Did I mention I can't hear? <laughs> huh? The second one is empathy. What company is empathetic towards its customers? Dove. Dove, for sure. Not Wendy's. Not Wendy's. <laughs> so now we continue down the not path. Anybody work for the NFL? Good, because they're not. Procter and Gamble. Who? Are we doing not? No, uh, let's do empathetic. <laughs> let's stay on the empathy path. I don't want to misguide us here. Anybody else? Yell it out. Johnson & Johnson. How about imperfection? This is interesting because I think we've heard this before and I believe this to be true that there is no perfect. So what... How do we embrace imperfection? How does a company embrace imperfection? Because every company is imperfect, but how do they embrace it? Which company? Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. Yeah. yeah. Well, they forgot my password this morning. <laughs> and so I'll get over it. Yeah? Anybody else? Farmers. Farmers? Yeah? Embrace they embrace accidents? Insurance you're talking about. Yeah. A anything else? That's a hard one, huh? Starbucks? When they forget your name? Yeah? They embrace your name? Facebook commercials. Interesting. I hadn't heard that one before. Oh, yeah. And, and, and we have Uber now that's advertising. Have you guys seen that? With we're sorry campaign and here's what we're going to do, which will be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, now, okay, so you guys went through this exercise with me on what actually are the traits of what it takes to be your most human self, not just as a person, which this does apply to people, but also as brands. 
So now if you were able to actually do this exact exercise for yourself or your company, you would start to see how people see you from the outside in. But the hardest part of this whole exercise is actually thinking about which brand has all three. Which brand actually embraces simplicity, empathy, and imperfection? Now, typically, I don't hear a lot of responses, and typically that's right, because it is really hard for companies and people to maintain all three. Except for the masseuse back there, she is awesome. Massage therapist. So I have empathy for you, and I have... That was a fun moment. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thank you, though. Um, So I do believe that while we're talking about humans and how we can embrace humanity, how we can be our best human selves, and how companies can be human... We also need to look at what today's topic is, which is the human experience, because H to H, human to human, plus customer experience equals human experience and how they think about it from front to end, from every interaction that they've ever had with your company, with your brand. Now, has anybody here ever been in a wave at a, at a stadium, like a football stadium or a soccer stadium? Raise your hand if you have been in a wave. Okay, so, so the, the lady way back there, you have not been in the wave, is that right? Way back in the corner there. Yes. The one who's saying, is it me? <laughs> have you been in the wave? Who back there did not raise their hand? Everyone's been in the wave. How about on this side? Anybody not been in the wave? Raise your hand. Oh, Yes. Can I ask you, please, what's your name? Mary? Terry. Terry. Could you please walk to one side and start everyone to do the wave? (laughs) And everyone's going to help you to know exactly what you need to do. And that's all the instruction I'm going to give you for now. Help her out, though. Okay, whoa, 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 hold on. The enthusiasm was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I want another one, please. Bring it back, too. Yeah, bring it back, he says. Go ahead. We could keep going if you want. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, I know. Um, so, so that's cool. So thank you, by the way. Um, Terry, uh, we're going to go to the UNO club and drinks are on me later. Okay? I'm kidding. Um, but I would like... Oh. Okay. Drinks are on me and I was planning on giving you two books. Okay. So, um, so I, I am really ex- excited about um, what you guys just did, not only because the, you guys did the wave at mid-afternoon and we got to <laughs> wake up a little bit, but, but also because this is what marketing is. So when you first think about, think about the process of what you just went through, it took one person to take the lead. It took one person to not truly understand what it was that, that she was going to do because she hadn't done it before. But then she got everyone over there in her group to start it. And then it kind of happened. And then the enthusiasm was okay. And then we did it again. And it worked the second time with a little more guidance and a little more understanding. And eventually the wave took off. And this is the same thing 
in social media. And it's the same thing that happens in marketing when we actually put things out there. But if you think about it, just it takes one person. It always takes one person. Like when you think about the bat kid in San Francisco, when that happened, it all got started because of a blogger that actually wrote about the bat kid and she got over 20,000 visits to the website and then everyone started contributing. Or you think about the a a ALS or ACL challenge, ALS challenge, and for the ice, the ice challenge, and everyone uh, took place in that, but it was all because of one person who had it that actually said, hey, I need help, and then, and then did this thing, and then all of a sudden everyone in Boston, right around this person, they can pinpoint exactly where it happened, grew into more and more and more and more, and became a wave. And then this thing ha ended up having Bill Gates and all these great people doing it, and it was fun. And it was the largest donation that we've ever seen because of one person and what they could do. This is totally possible. If we wanted things to go off, we can actually inspire and motivate people to do this as just one person, as just one small group or one small company. You can totally achieve it. Crazy George actually started the wave in 1984 in uh, San Francisco, at the, uh, in Oakland, I mean, at the Oakland A's Coliseum. And, um, and he got everybody to stand up and sit down. But it took him two years before he got everyone to actually do it. It didn't happen overnight. What you just did actually was better than what he did the first time that he tried it. It took him two years to get a stadium to stand up and sit down at the right time and go, that was fun. Why did we do that? And, and, then, and then he finally got them to do it. And guess what happened? It happened at every other stadium every two weeks for the next year, and everyone was doing the wave everywhere. The wave became a wave. So there are different kinds of inputs as we look at all of the technology and human um, engagement, everything out there that we're talking about now isn't just sitting down and standing up. We have so much data that's out there that we can't find every single person. We can't scale relationships. It's impossible for one person to scale all the different people that are out there on Twitter or on Facebook or on Instagram. So we have to use tools and technology to do that. We can find needles in the haystack with the right technology. And actually, I'm going to share some examples of what those are in a, in a little bit. Um, it's also important to understand that we're dealing with three different categories. One is the H to H category. We just did that in the wave. One person to the next, to the next, to the next. The next one's H to M, humans to machines. And the last one is machines to machines. Humans to machines are like when we go up and we actually put our ATM card into a, um, our, our debit card into an ATM and we pull money out. And it's really strange because my son thinks we get rich every time I do that. <laughs> and I've like really tried hard to explain to him that's my money I'm pulling out. Um, we'll, we'll keep working on that. And then the next one is machine to machine. That's, that's when two machines are talking together to pull data in and they don't need us for that. Now that is where it's heading, but eventually we do have to interpret that data to make sure that we understand it. The difference between also, um, one thing before I move forward, the, the one difference between all of those is that H to H has an input and the rest of them have output. Machines, mach humans input into machines. We have to drive a question. We have to drive a question. That means we are the only beings that can create an experience. We are the only people, the only thing, you know, robots will never be able to create a unique experience driving human emotions and, all, and everything that goes with that. I'll talk about that more as well. But before we do that, I want to describe to you one experience that I thought drove a really wonderful human experience, take shots, is um, on Amazon. Amazon had this, this great conversation with this one customer on online chat, and it went like this. The customer said, tracking shows delivered, but shipment was not received. And Amazon knew this customer and knew who he was and said, warmest greetings, my name is Thor. And the customer said, greetings, Thor, can I be Odin? And the Amazon guy said, Odin, father, how art thou doing on this here fine day? <laughs> and the customer said, Thor, my son, agony raises upon my life. Amazon said, this is outrageous. Who dares defy the all father of Odin? What has occurred to cause this agony? Well, I'm afraid the book I ordered to feed our enemies has been misplaced. How can we keep Valhalla intact without our sacred book? Do you think a robot can do that? No way. No way. Personalize the conversation to the customer, redeem themselves, 
eventually actually got the book to the customer overnight in the next day. And then this conversation became a viral conversation because it was so, like they gave permission to the customer service person to have this kind of conversation, which, which most brands don't. Some do, not, not most. And so it's funny, I was showing uh, Fanzo earlier um, I, I, that it really is humans and machines working together. It's not humans versus machines because we have to have the technology of the online chat to be able to bring that person closer, but it takes the human to engage and have that experience and make it unique with the Gaylord Fokker examples of humor, right? Or imperfection or simplicity or empathy. And yet throughout the entire marketing experience, and don't worry, I'll actually sum the screen up for you so you don't have to um, <laughs> strain your eyes looking at it. But this is the entire customer value process. This is everything that it takes on every single touch point to get through to somebody to actually have them purchase a product or, or a service. And if we put it really simply, if we actually just narrow it down to what's really important here, on the left-hand side, it really is social media that starts the engaged human relationship. And then on the right-hand side, it has three different levels. Now, I'm going to actually redefine this for you. Instead of calling it tripwire, <laughs> core product, and maximizer, we're going to look at this like McDonald's or Starbucks looks at their process, because this applies to every single business. Now, let's choose McDonald's. McDonald's will, um, McDonald's will uh, sell you a tripwire, which is the the toy inside of the, um, the, the, uh, the child's meal or the happy meal. The next one is the core product. The core product is the actual hamburger. And then the super size it is the next one up, which is the profit maximizer. Companies have been doing this for years. It's three different levels, one to pull you in, the next to share exactly what the product or service is, and then the next one to sell you up. And along the way, we know that not everybody's ready to buy. And so then eventually we need to put them into a place where we can keep in touch and communicate with them. The whole challenge has been that it's hard to actually do this, harder to do this now more than ever. Is that Siri? Hey Siri, good to see you. Um, then, <laughs> that was funny. So, and, and it's really hard to do that because we have so many different multi-touches. We talked about multi, uh, omnipresence or multi-touch or whatever you want to call it, it takes seven to ten touches in order to actually turn somebody from um, a potential customer into a customer on average. And so if we need to do that and we want to automate that process and then also inject human touch points into that, think about how complex that is. Don't worry, I'm going to simplify that further. Here's how I would do it. I would literally walk up to a, wh a whiteboard if you're looking for a way to actually embed it, <laughs> oh! and then I would take these three different categories. These categories are actually built or uh, first imagined by Scott Oldford, a, a friend of mine who works in the, um, in the funnel area, and he talks about um, some of these things. That, so basically how it lays out is it, it's awareness, omnipresence, and intimacy. Awareness is generally you don't know about that company or person, and now you do, right? So you can do that with Facebook ads. You can do that with, on Twitter, if you didn't want to put money down. You can do that just about anywhere that you want to create awareness, um, that you're wherever your audience is. The next one's omnipresence. Omnipresence is kind of where you show up again. So they saw you the first time, they're aware of you, they don't quite understand what you do, and then you want to get more interaction with them. So you're going to gain their trust. Trust is where omnipresence is, or omnipresence is where trust is built. Okay, and that can be done with retargeting. It can be done with email marketing. It can be done with phone calls. It used to be done on pagers. Just kidding. And so, um, so then the third thing is intimacy. Now intimacy is where H to H actually happens. So now they know who you are. They've seen you, they trust you, and they might be ready to buy. 
Intimacy is the actual conversation that happens that then converts them into a customer. Now, if they're not ready, they go back through the process again. So these three things are the exact same things that I showed you on the process before in that chart. Very simplified, and this is exactly how, um, how we as humans, how we tend to buy things. We have to earn trust before we're ever going to put our money into something, right? Disney knew all about this, and he knew about it in 1954 before he built anything. He actually mapped out the entire customer human experience, one of the first map drawings that's ever happened, because he actually mapped out every single touch point for every customer for where they might head before he built things like his studios or his, um, uh, his publications or his magazine or his comic strips or his merchandising or licensing or, um, or any of the products that, or any of the movie films that he made. And all those lines that you see, and you can just Google this and it's online, so it's just a, a Disney, a Disney um, planned experience. And, or, or my slides are accessible, so email me and I'll send it to you. Um, and, you, and, and every single line that's in here is a, is a considered human touch point. So, for instance, if you go to a park, you don't see any of the actors, which are their staff, um, ever anywhere in the park except for where they work. And that's because he designed paths underneath the park so that they could walk between where they actually worked underneath uh, the entire park and then out and exit so you never see them. He, he designed experiences around where, how trash was treated and how, we, how they needed to clean it up and when it needed to be cleaned up. He designed the experience around his films in a certain way that was unique to everything else. And he mapped it all out ahead of time, saying this is how I want that human touch point, how that person should feel in that instance. So what could you do to replicate that process? You could simply go to a whiteboard and map out each area where you send out your marketing, whether it's a tweet or it's um, everything that you do and just um, an email, um, an ad, um, person walks into the store and every single point that you map out, you can then start to look at the spaces in between those existing touch points and say, how am I going to enhance this process? How am I gonna make it better? How am I gonna do something that's over and above what they're already doing at these critical points for where they're already interacting with my business. And that's what Disney did. They looked at everything in between the experiences to make that better. Now we have the ability of doing that as people. We know that now, by now, as I've shared with you, that, that machines don't have the ability of sharing in, in, a, in a moment of, of humanity is the best way of saying it. We know that by sharing an experience, I'm going to bring you closer. For instance, has anybody here been on the Cars ride in Disneyland or Disney World? Obviously, I'm a Disney fan. Yeah. And so at the end of the Cars ride, there's a big dip and it just goes straight down. And at that one moment, it takes a picture of you, not at your most flattering moment. And then all of a sudden, you know, and then you, you walk down, you get off the ride, and then you go through the toy store where they charge you $9,999 for everything. And then you go into the photo area, and then, you know, your photo is there showing everything that happened that you, you know, your picture of you and your family going down that one moment. And at that one moment, they took a picture of us, and that's my family up on the screen. And you can't see it too well because of the wall, but I'll tell you this. Uh, it turned my daughter into Jesus. Because her, her hair perfectly aligned underneath her jaw and over the top lip of her, um, her upper lip. And all of a sudden, we were just cracking up, right? And this was just so funny, but I, I took a picture of it. I shared it online as I always do, you know, in these funny kind of like Gaylord Fokker moments. But I also started to think that this is something that will always be authentic to who we are, that a machine can't actually share an experience of something that's so close to us, that that's my daughter, who is a beautiful girl, by the way, and she, can, she has this one experience of, of having this great, funny photo. And so um, I don't think that that's something that we will ever see machines being able to pull out and actually share with other people. If you wanna do that in your own company, and that's how this applies, Take a picture that you think really resonates at the core of who you are 
you know, of you, your employees, your staff, actually show and share, like everyone's been saying earlier today, who you are in the moment. And that's where you're going to get the good stuff. That's what people really want to see and why they want to belong to your company or your product. There are also six different emotions that were, that were um, researched by Paul Ekman. And Paul Ekman um, is this emotional, uh, emotional expert. He put together this different, um, these different emotions, the, the six different basic core emotion, emotions. They splinter off into different areas. But the core emotions are fear, anger, sadness, disgust, joy, and surprise. Now, I'm gonna take the 25 pages of research and narrow it down to the, boil it down to the one thing that, and save you all time on the whole thing so you don't have to read it. And the thing is, is that if you share in one of these different emotions, people are highly likely in sharing back in reciprocity on an even, even playing field. When Damien shared his, his videos earlier, they were hilarious. I didn't think they were funny, but everyone else did. And everyone, um, everyone had a good time. And now we also responded with humor. In most cases, people are going to respond in the same way that you delivered the content. So if we deliver content on Facebook and you see somebody share something that's sad or joyous or surprising, the comments back, you'll notice, are in that same category because that's what we do. We care as people. And so we care in the same manner as what people share back. Now, if you really want to take this to the next level, then take all of your content and ma- make sure it matches up so that it's more three-dimensional and human-like and you're not just sharing one emotion all the time because that's not who we are and that's not what we do. Now, there are also um, six different sharing types. So as you start, and this, this is a research project that the New York Times did, and then I ended up taking their, um, their research and turning it into an algorithm, and I had over 25,000 people take this, um, take this and, and tell me whether, you know, which category they are. I'm gonna jump the line for you guys, and I'll tell you exactly what they are, and you can decide for yourself which category you fit into. The first one, um, is an altruist. The altruist is somebody who shares from their heart. These are heart sharers that actually share um, emotionally uh, uh, loving, uh, heartfelt messages. Um, they ca- they re- reply with, with heart and caring for what other people say. They're supportive. The second person is a careerist. This type of social sharer or share, general human sharer is somebody who likes to build thought leadership. They like to be on live video. They like to create content. They like to help others succeed in their own careers. The third one is an early adopter. An early adopter is somebody who might go out and purchase something or learn something first so that they can turn it around and teach it to other people. The third one is a boomerang. This is the most interesting to me because it has two meanings. One is it's a person who likes to drive questions at everyone else so that they can get engaged conversation or communication so that they can then respond, kind of like a community manager would. Or they um, are trolls. They like to drive a question only to get a, a certain negative response. We'll go on the lighter side for now. And then selective, a selective likes to share in private. They direct message someone. They like to do a private email. They, they want to keep things behind the scenes and not really share too much publicly. And there's a little bit of each of these in all of us. You can be more than one. Typically, we tilt towards one more than others. But some days we feel one more than the other. And the other days we feel we can switch between these. I would also suggest that you put your, when you go to ask influencers or you go to ask people outside of your organization to share or engage with your brand, you realize that not everybody is created equal. So if you're asking a selective to share on social media, the chances of that happening is probably not good. Now, if you do get a selective to actually share, the chances of everyone listening to that person is probably really strong because nobody ever hears, they hardly hear from a selective. And there are research studies that show, too, that if, um, and this happened actually in a, in a campaign uh, for, um, for McDonald's where they actually tested um, a selective, uh, just having selectives share, and the, and the results went off the roof because they never share. 
and people trusted them more. So if you really want to have some great results, find yourself a group of selectives, earn their trust, and send them off as brand ambassadors, and you'll probably find a really good campaign. Um, so the success of being human, as we now know, relies on the intimacy and engagement of people, how we interact with them, having one-off um, in, uh, conversations with them, working towards that engaged conversation to the point where you have created intimacy and they now trust you and want to buy from you. But what's missing from the whole process is the, um, the delight they didn't see coming. It's the stuff that you never think of until after the fact because they may or may not have bought from you. So who here had a job in college? Those of you who didn't, man, go, go you. And if, <laughs> um, and I had a job in college. I was a Domino's pizza delivery driver. I had the hat, I had the flag on my car, and I would drive pizzas um, everywhere. And I realized that college students don't have money to pay tips. This was a hard lesson to learn because at the end of the night, I was not making hardly any tips and I was getting really frustrated. I wasn't making any money. So I was trying to decide what value I could bring and I realized that most college students were thirsty and they weren't ordering drinks. So at Safeway, I realized that there was also a pallet of two liters for 25 cents at the time when I went to college on a special that they had and I bought the entire end cap, put it into my, I know it was a long time ago, and I put it into my Chevy uh, Blazer and I, bought, and, I, and I delivered with a medium or larger, a two liter. And where they w used to not have any money for tips, they were starting to look at me and go, well, I didn't order that, um, that two liter, and, and, uh, but I'm really thirsty. And I said, no, it's free, it's, it's for you. Go ahead and take it. And, and they would go, oh. Now realize that they had cotton, cotton mouth, they were all stoned. So, um, <laughs> and so, so they go, no way, man. That's exactly what I needed. And, um, and they would pull out $5 and $10 and start tipping me way higher than I was ever used to because I had delivered something with so extra uh, value over and above what they needed that my cost was near nothing and yet my tip ratio went off the charts and I was making all this money. <laughs> and every, th every time they, uh, they would do that, um, I was getting really excited. I was making all this money. And then all of a sudden, I got a call a month later into the office and they said, you have to stop doing it because we're getting calls that they're not getting two liters from the other drivers. <laughs> and I was like, you need to adopt this program. Like this could make everybody rich. And um, so that was my last day. <laughs> they weren't gonna go for it. Years later, they actually started doing something like that. And I was like, what the heck? Uh, anyway. Uh, this isn't a therapy session, so I'll, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> so my point being that when you deliver something over and above, not just in between, we talked about the human experience, we talked about the human touch points, we talked about the funnel and how do you fit everything inside that matters to people um, that may go above and beyond the experiences that they're already having with your business that you could do right now. You could go back to your office and you can map this whole thing out and, and you can have something that really achieves something much better than what people are getting from you today but then go the extra step and deliver something that is super powerful, unexpected delivery of something that they might need that you can give them that's over the top and they will go, they will be a client for life. Now, it's funny because I, when you think of uh, brands, you don't think of KFC as a brand that actually would operate, I think normally on that level. But they did something interesting, um, I think this was about six months ago, somewhere around there, and in the UK, the KFC stores all across the UK ran out of chicken. <laughs> Let me say that again. KFC ran out of chicken. Who does that? That guy that did not order the chicken <laughs> is an idiot. <laughs> so anyway. They had to put this advertising up. They had to actually go out and say, I'm sorry. And they had to tell everybody that we're gonna get chicken, we're working on it, we'll get it back 
in as soon as possible. And they did put an ad together and they put it out there and they said something very generic on the bottom of the ad of, we're sorry, a chicken restaurant without any chicken? <laughs> it's not ideal. Huge apologies to our customers, especially those who traveled out of their way to find we're closed. And an endless thank, thank you to the team members, blah, 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 blah. But here's where they went right. Now, remember, the human traits of what I talked about before, when I talked about uh, what makes Gaylord Fokker human, they ended up making fun of themselves. Instead of KFC, <laughs> they said FCK. <laughs> and people went nuts. They started tweeting this like there was no tomorrow. I would have tweeted it if I was living in the UK. I'm like, that's brilliant. They had people tweeting all kinds of things, like apology accepted, best apology ever. Um, hats off to KFC, brilliant, gutsy ad. But here's the best part. By being human, making fun of themselves and embracing their imperfection, they released this statement that from the information we have been given, nine out of 10, and so 708 out of 780 of the total restaurants in their franchise area, of our team members will not be financially worse off this week than they would have been if we were fully operational. That means they made their money back the day they opened their doors because of that move. So by embracing their humanity, they leveled out the entire financial spectrum of everything they could have lost. That's powerful. And so now we know about why being human is important. And I promised you that I would share some tools that you can use to find some needles in the haystack that you can use to actually scale your, enga your engagement or your, um, or your um, reaching out to people or, or, or just shorting, shortening the time that you use. So there are three really cool tools that I would suggest. One is x.ai. x.ai is... Um, is, an, is a uh, virtual assistant. Um, they go by uh, two names, Andrew and Amy. You can use andrew.x.ai or amy.x.ai. And you can actually um, email somebody and copy Amy or Andrew and then say, can you please schedule a meeting with this person next week for 30 minutes? And she has, or he has all the information that you've already set into the system and it will uh, then at that point um, do the meeting for you and you're not on any of the emails. The, um, the, the, the amount of time that I save with this is about three to four hours a week of all the back and forth that goes on with somebody who cancels and that we can't meet this time or we have to move this and I don't have this and do you have this? And, and I'm like, oh, I hate meeting planning. So this is one of the things that I really like. And these are kinds of things that I think are coming where we can actually save time. I'm not f afraid of these kinds of tools because I think the more that we can save time to actually have the real conversations, which is what I want to get to, then that's why I like these tools. If it makes any decisions beyond that, I don't think it's a useful tool or it's, it then would creep me out. Bless you. The next one is nudge.ai. There isn't any way to actually keep up with everybody in what they're doing across the board for all of their content or what's happening to them in their lives. I realized like for example, um, I had a friend that had hired me to come out and speak at an Adobe event a couple years back and I had not kept up. I didn't realize what was going on in this person's life. And so Nudge.ai collects all of my contacts, everybody that's in my world, and lets me know what's going on with all the content that's said about them or that they have written about. And it brings it to my attention. And that way I can actually engage with them um, uh, on, you know, on, on what's going on in their lives. So I ended up congratulating him on a TEDx that he did. And he responded back and say, saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much. By the way, I've been meaning to reach out to you. I'd love to have you come speak at the thing. So I was like, well, that's cool. But that's not going to happen all the time. However, we do need to stay in touch with everybody. We just don't have the time to do it. So nudge.ai actually allows you, brings the information to you. And then the last one, which is actually in full transparency, is a company that I consult with, but it's called Try Lately. And, um, and the coolest feature of the whole thing that I always like to share is that for all of the social posts that we end up writing, it has Watson AI built in. So all you do is you put your link to your blog in, 
and it creates all of your social posts for you within a few seconds. And you'll have dozens of social posts, and then you can schedule it out right there, and it'll go um, do all, the, all that work for you. So it is the stuff that you've already written. It's not writing it for you. It's just breaking it into social posts and then sizing it for every single network that's out there, which also takes time. So you take the four hours that you're building all your social posts and put it down into a few seconds. That's a lot of, a lot of time saved. All right, so those are the tools. I, I, I wanted to share those tools with you because those are the ways that we can actually scale. Um, in final thoughts, build your circle of trust and embrace your Fokker moments. Being human is, and in fact, if you can remember this one thing more than anything else, being human is your competitive advantage. Understand how to approach others through their sharing type. Embrace h to h philosophies for deeper intimacy and better conversations. And it's humans and machines working together. Um, if you want to learn more, I actually have a new video series that I just released. It's free. And if you go to h2hcompanies.com and sign up, I just launched this actually this last week. And it is a free video series that walks you through not at a much deeper level exactly how to do all these different things of building your human touch points, how to build out your uh, funnel, and how to build all this stuff for your company. So go ahead and sign up for that there if you like. Um, and that is, that is pretty much it. If you did like this presentation, my name is Brian Kramer. If you did not like this presentation, my name is Brian Fanzo. <laughs> Thank you so much.